And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me, ever returning good brother to the temple, coming to us all the way from Post World Games, currently running a another one of his quick starter and another one of his quick starter um bouts of bouts of craziness and and a and the return of protocol squared the one and only jim pinto how you doing today I, man i'm good was i supposed to be drunk for this <laughs> um nah you okay. you can be as drunk as you want to be all right. Well, I show up drunk for everything, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. I'm drunk all the time, so nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually just I usually just go with, well, I'm, I'm as drunk as you think I am. Uh, I have a really funny drunk story about Gen Con. I don't know if we want to start with that, mm -hmm. but it's kind of funny. Well, what what en what ended up happening? So it was the first year it was in Indianapolis, in mm -hmm. Indianapolis mm -hmm. and uh, Fantasy Flight had put on this party the first night of the show. It was either Wednesday or Thursday. I cannot remember. And free booze, all you wanted, opening of the show, and I just kept pounding beers. And a bunch of people said, hey, we're going to the White Wolf Party. Turned out the White Wolf Party wasn't that night. But none of us knew that. I said, okay. And I'm feeling warm, but I'm not drunk or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we start walking around all over downtown looking for the party. One person thinks they have the address. And of course, all that beer is coursing through me now and I've got to pee. And we've covered about 25 blocks looking for this party. And I can't, I, I can't hold it any longer. And I find one of those billboards that comes up off the ground. They're mm -hmm. common in the Midwest. Yep. Um, and I just go hiding behind that and I just, you know, publicly urinate which obviously you know you're not supposed to do but i have i don't have any options mm -hmm. uh, it's either that or ruin my pants and i come out and sure enough i did not realize i was right in front of the police station <laughs> so the cop is yelling at me and he's calling me over and i i walk over I, at first i tried to play it off i don't know who he's yelling at but that didn't work so i go walking over there and he's looking me straight in the eye and i'm probably I'm not inebriated, but I probably had gl was glassy eyed. Um, and he says, you know, we caught you on security camera urinating in public. I said, yes, sir. I understand. He said, you know, I have to arrest you, right? I said, yes, sir. I understand. I was very polite. I was just shaking my head up and down. And I didn't want to cause I didn't want to do anything that was going to make this worse or force him to give me a breathalyzer. Mm hmm. And so he says to me, the best thing you can do is get out of here as fast as possible. I said, OK. And I just beelined out of there all the while. All my friends and this big group of people I didn't know were this gaggle of people I've been walking with. They're yelling, Jim, Jim, what's going on? I didn't want to give the cop any excuse. I didn't even make eye contact with them. I just said, I'll see you later. And I just walked straight to my hotel. I don't know how I got there. The next thing I knew, it was four o'clock in the morning. My pants were half off. I'm laying on my bed. I could not tell you what the last five blocks were like getting back to my hotel. Although that's um, that's an impre that's an impressive use of that's an impressive use of directions. <laughs> <laughs> what what's funny about it is it was the beginning of the convention, right? If I'd been arrested, mm -hmm. I would have, and I was working for a company at the time. I would have missed work the next day. And how do you explain that? We flew you out to Gen Con, and you chose to get drunk and arrested on our dime. <laughs> Yeah, that no. that'd be that'd be um a little bit hard to explain. Yeah. Um So now as I as I understand it, um Protocol Squared is a is a series of GMless um micro games that you that you've de that you've developed. And Correct. Home, home was the first of them originally. Mm -hmm. And now you're bringing it back is would it be fair of me to call this a director's cut of home uh well protocol itself is the original system the protocol mm -hmm. squared is yeah the director's cut yeah um so the rules are a little little more refined there's more questions there's more charts there's more finales to it so that there's uh more opportunities to continue playing for a few more rounds 
Uh, it's basically just a more embellished version of what people already know. But right. as opposed to 30 pages, like the original, this one's nearly 100. Mm-hmm. So you're getting nicer art. You're getting a nicer layout. You're getting more advice. Um, if you've never played one of these kind of games, this is probably the one to start with because the book has so much advice in it. Yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this the um, Protocol series is a GM-less game. Yes. Now... I'm cur- I'm curious what what um was the impetus to go GM list because even with the huge amount of variety of games that there are these days, GM list games or games that even just do a rotating um role with GMs are still a very, very small minority. Uh yeah, well the majority of what I make falls into this category of rotating GM. Mm-hmm. Um or, or director, as it's called in the game. I'm really a huge fan, and, and granted, I've got more GM-oriented games coming in the future, uh, but I'm really a big fan of everybody sharing and telling of the story. I wanted something that's over in a night. I wanted something where everybody's creativity is valuable. I don't think a game like D&D played with the wrong kind of GM lends itself to creativity, right? We know the mm-hmm. kind of DM that I'm talking about where they just control everything and yeah, the, add, yeah, the railroader. The um, yeah, as my, you don't get to add, as, you don't get to add anything. You're just a victim of the story. As my mentor would call him, the novelist. Yeah, no disrespect to people who actually write novels, but that's just how he put it. He he would constantly say a novelist is just shorthand for a bad DM. Right. Um, um and so that that's what I, I wanted to fill that space where fantasy players could sit down, play this game in an evening as a break or in this case in this edition there's actually a page of advice on how to incorporate into your ongoing campaign Mm -hmm. um but when i make these games i really want to create these concentrated experiences where you're getting a lot more story in an evening than you would normally get if you were just meeting at a tavern and waiting for the gm to hand you the plot now Obviously, for a lot for a lot of people, um, protocol it, this partic- this particular protocol squared. This is going to be their first introduction to the protocol system. So, what could someone reasonably expect from what the what that particular kind of game is going to expect from them? Uh, well, they're going to learn the, the they're going to learn terms like canon and shared authority and agency, um, and they're going to learn. Th- what scene framing is, which is the most important element of a jamless game. You're already playing in games, no matter what you're playing that has scene framing in it. Mm -hmm. You just don't have the formalized language for it. When the game master says, okay, you're all sitting in a tavern. It's noisy. It's smelly. The barmaid is ignoring you. um, And you see a crazy witch in the corner. That's all scene framing, but we don't call it that when we're playing D and D because there's no language for that. But when you're doing that in a game like this, you're taking turns doing that and setting up those scenes and doing them in order. And the way that protocol works versus some of the other GMless games that are on the market is the, the, the deck of cards and the charts provide you with all the framework you need to create those scenes as quickly and easily as possible. Mm-hmm. And I will, I've, I've made it clear over, over the years that I am very much a sucker for introducing, um, playing card mechanics into RPGs. Um, yeah, I love it too. <laughs> now, speaking of that, in the in the uh, segment where you where you go on about the um about the rules, it mentions that there's going to be rules for vignettes, interludes, interrogations and ensembles. Yes. Now, obviously I'm not going to have you go into full exhaustive detail on each, but Give me the skinny on all, on all four of them and what sure. the um, general vibe would be when one of those is drawn. Uh, the ensemble is the one everybody knows, right? That's where everybody at the table is involved in the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it has very specific rules in terms of how you can lead the scene or what happens if there's conflict. Um, but it's, it, it's really the easiest to wrap your head around. Mm-hmm. And then there's an interlude, which is two characters who already have what's called a pre-established relationship. And there's rules for how you build relationships at the beginning of the book. 
those two people have a scene together. The other players, they have to spend drama points if they want to get involved. But if they don't get involved, then they get a drama point at the end of the scene. Um, and those are pretty straightforward, too. Those are the easiest to for even the most novice players to get their head around. Yeah. The vignette and the interrogation are a little different. The vignette is sort of a, a, a mood setter. It's an action scene or it's an exposition scene or it just it's the opening shot of the movie kind of thing. It's the transition between scenes. It's an opportunity to show how things are going on without worrying about the interaction of the players. It's all narration. It's all setting based. Um, and the vignette is really helpful when it comes up for linking scene ideas together or resolving the conflict that happened in a previous scene. Mm -hmm. You, you can also use it to show the bad guys. You can use it to show what the ending might look like. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do with vignettes and they're really wide open, but the main ingredient is that there's no talking in them. So you put whoever you want into them. Yeah. And then the interrogation, which is my favorite is where you ask another character five questions and those questions can be in character out of character they can be voices in their heads they can be an, an interrogation scene where where an npc is interrogating them or a pc is interrogating them um or they could just be filling out a, a form right and their answers to the questions go on the form whatever i'm not gonna pigeonhole it because you can do so much with it but the idea is that i can either ask you five questions about what are you going to do what's going on in your past um, I can ask you even world building questions at this point saying, why is it that magic doesn't work the way we think it works? And whatever you say becomes canon. And those five questions, and you don't have to ask all five if you don't want to, but those five questions really give an opportunity for players to add a lot of richness to the story. And like I said, it can be either in character or out of character. There's, there's all kinds of room to do whatever you want with an interrogation. Mm -hmm. And, when it com when it comes to the when it comes to those inter when it comes to those interrogations, something I'm curious about is um why f why five questions? What what made you um settle down on that number? Is it is just a case of that just seemed to be the number that fit, or was there another reason? It it was mathematically it fit the most in terms of costing you a scene. Normally, when you you're getting a scene. You can add lots of details and rhythm to the story, and you can expand the, the canon quite a bit with an ensemble or a vignette. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to balance that, the interrogator really needs to have enough questions to impact the story. Yeah. Now, when it comes to character creation within um, Protocol, if I'm, re if, if I'm reading this correctly, that's also yeah. determined via card draw. Yes. Um, and I believe the elements of that are um, role, background, motivation, and rela and um, relationship. Yes. Um. Now, what can what can you tell me about wh about what each one of those elements would entail? Well, your role and your background are kind of what everybody's come to expect from a fantasy game, right? Mm -hmm. Your background might be you come from an impoverished family and your role might be, <coughs> excuse me, your role might be a scout mm -hmm. or a soldier or a war mage or whatever it is that you draw from the chart. Um, I think Longbowman's on the chart. There's a number of different things. There's 13 of them, one for each value in a deck. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what everybody's come to expect a character to be. That's your first dimension. Your second dimension comes into play when you get your motivation. Um, and the motivation card draw is going to be a suit and a value. And that's going to give you two prompts that tell you something like um, your, uh, your what's something you might draw. Uh, you're vehemently motivated to uh, re get a fresh restart in your life or to overcome adversity or to take an oath or pay back a debt. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have to find it, figure out why those two terms go together to justify your motivation. Now that's going to give you your second dimension, but they're not going to give you your third dimension. Your third dimension is going to come through role playing through answering the, the world building questions. When you finally start fleshing out the meat that you're getting, mm -hmm. 
And then finally, there's the relationship. And that's really a helpful step because you pick somebody else at the table and you find out how it is that you know each other beyond just, in this case, being soldiers on their way home from a, a war. Uh, you there, There's further context. And you're in a, you know, in a perfect situation, every character ends up with two relationships. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes one character has one and one has three. But... Um, in a perfect situation, everybody has two relationships. So you're tied to at least two people at the table. So you have a vested interest in one another. Mm-hmm. Even if your relationship is hatred, you still are tied to one another, and that helps define who both of you are. Yeah, when when it came when it comes to the relationship thing, when I was reading that, one of the things that instantly came to mind because of how because of how many books I go through is a a little bit of a thing that's in the focuses in um, cipher system. Where it where it'll use where it'll have some sort of note where the person on your left blank, um, depending on the focus, and obviously I'm oversimplifying it. Sure. Is when it comes to the whole relationship thing, does it work? Does it work in a sim- in a similar manner where there's a where there's a seed like question that's that's listed that the that the group would have to um fi- have to figure out, or is it more open ended? <coughs> it's it's a it's not a seed like question. I've done that before for other products but in protocol it's the same thing you draw a card and you're going to get the two prompts right Mm -hmm. we have a long-term relationship that's contentious for instance i think that would be a eight of clubs um and we have to determine you and i if we're sitting down and playing we have to determine why it is you and i have a long-term contentious relationships right are we are we siblings who mom loved you more uh and so and you've never acknowledged that that that's one question that might come to mind, uh, but we need to establish that before we can move on with play, because we need to know why it is that you and I are contentious. Mm-hmm. Now, when it came now when it came to uh, it sounds like with some of these they're determined mainly by um, card value, and some of them it's by card value and suit. Um, yeah, all of them are card value and suit except for the roll. Which um, I think is understandable because the idea of the idea of trying to make fifty two different rolls might be pushing your luck a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it would get repetitive, right? Mm-hmm. They, you'd have a lot of the same thing. What's yeah. the difference between a scout and a pathfinder? I know that there was that there was that um, roll one roll D one hundred pyramid that some that somebody made of of a bunch of different class titles, but that was. Um, that was ma- that was made solely as a gag. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but when it comes to some of the others, because the, I think you mentioned background is one is one instance where it's um where it's card value and suit. Um, yeah. Within the suit within the suit types, are there general themes that are worked around? Yeah. So I'm gonna actually go to the chart. I've got it open on my mm-hmm. computer now. Um, so the way that the for instance, the backgrounds work here is if you draw, I don't know, call something out. You draw a nine go, of hearts. Yeah, nine of hearts. Loved one waiting at home and mm-hmm. you're spoiled. So that's the, you know, the background that you have because you've drawn the, the, the nine of hearts. So yeah. you've obviously gone off to war maybe without wanting to and you're spoiled. So you weren't expecting this rough of a journey home mm-hmm. from from the war and if you also for your role had gotten the uh, the chaplain that's that becomes an interesting combination of factors and because you're drawing cards for all these every time you're playing you're getting completely new context for for the game establishing who's who's there and who's not yeah now i know that r- with home you have it set up that these are soldiers um coming coming home from a war in a um, fantasy setting but would it be fair of me to say that even even within it being a fantasy setting you're not be, you're not playing hard and fast about what sort of fantasy setting you're dealing with because contrary to the belief of some not all fantasy is created equal <laughs> <laughs> that is correct that is correct and while it is a grounded the tone is very grounded you could put this in any campaign mm-hmm. honestly so long as the journey is taking you 16 or 20 scenes to get home because you don't get home until the end of the game. Mm-hmm. You could play in anything. If you have a magic carpet 
if you decide you're playing high fantasy and you have a magic carpet, you still need to explain why it's taking so long to get home. Mm -hmm. So the thing with, with protocol and protocol squared is just because you have a tool for solving a problem doesn't mean that the problem is solved. And now you, now that, that amount of scenes that you mentioned, that's interesting. Was that, was that the average amount of scenes that, ha that happened during um, play testing? No, no, it's just four times around the mm -hmm. table per player. So if you're in a four player game, you've got 16 scenes in a five player game, you have 20. Um, and that happens because you have a suit, you have a deck of 13 cards within a suit. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you play too much more than that, you're going to see a lot of repetition. Yeah. And I, I know that when it came to gameplay, you talked about ha you talked about um, accommodating rules for what would happen if somebody drew the Joker. But do you have is there anything taken into account if somebody drew the Joker during character creation? Uh, during character creation for everything but the role, yes. So it it is covered on all the charts except for the role. Mm -hmm. Oh. Since you since you had since you had the um, chart set um, set up in front of you, just out of curiosity, if the Joker was drawn for background, what would that entail? I have to go back to that page now. Hold on a second. I will mm -hmm. find it though. Oh, bam! Uh, outright black sheep of the family and village. That's what you get for a Joker. <laughs> yeah, I've, I figured I figured Joker would be the uh, would be the extreme um, kind of result compared to the others. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, for relationships, it's lovers in times of crisis. Um, that's much better than just having a romantic relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the world building question, um, like I see, I see that kind of thing, and I'm remi I'm reminded of th of um of more abstract. Um, character creation elements, like say aspects in Fate or the one unique thing in Thirteenth Age, and I'm, I'm curious when it comes to the world building question, if you have a, uh, if you plan on putting in a guide of general do's and don'ts as far as what that, qu what would make a good or not so good question. There's a chart of twenty five of them, so you you don't make them up. Mm -hmm. They're right there in the in the book, and they point you to how to. They point you to various, you don't answer all of them, but you're going to pick and choose or you're going to uh, pick a number by random. Mm -hmm. And that question is going to inform what you need to know in order to play in this adventure. Yeah. And I'm, gu and I'm guessing the world building questions would be things like what would be things like what style, what style of fantasy it is, how high or low the magic is, that kind of thing. Yeah, those three are baked right into world building. You have to answer those before you can get to the the tougher ones. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question, who's the most patriotic person in the group and who's the least? Who's done something cowardly? Who knows about it? Yeah. Uh, and then there's some that say, name and describe an NPC who's chasing you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't know which ones you're going to get. And so those questions have a tendency to change the plot drastically. Yeah. Now, what, um, you had mentioned... You had mentioned kind of um, four full rounds with four people. Um, would four people at the table be the be the ideal group size? And is it e is it easier? Or does it get more? Does it get trickier when you have a larger group? Uh, four or five is good. I, I tend to prefer four because we get started quicker and we play through it quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, but six is when it starts getting to be a little heavy. It takes a longer time to get around the table. You have more disparate stories going on and you always increase the likelihood of somebody showing up with a stupid character named Ace who, you know, thinks he's the crack shot of the group as if that matters. You're playing through the drama of getting home. You're not playing through how well you can shoot out a duck's eye. Uh, and so, you know, I think six players is too much. We've made it work before, but Four and five are the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Now, with with a lot of the card draws that we've seen, it's been mo it's been mostly about um, scenes and and um, the and the shared narrative. Um, how does this card system handle conflict? Whether it's conflict with the environment or conflict interpersonally. 
so the the way that it works, there's actually special advanced rules for using the deck to resolve conflict if you want. Mm -hmm. um, normally what happens if somebody gets into conflict with something or anything, the scene just ends and it's left on a cliffhanger and it's for somebody else to resolve. Um, alternatively, you can spend a drama point and you can narrate what the conclusion is. An alternative to that, the advanced rule is to have all the people involved in the conflict draw a card each and the highest value wins the conflict and they get to narrate how it's resolved. All right. Um, I'm a, I'm a personal fan of the cliffhanger. Actually, it it writes better stories. Mm -hmm. I'm I mainly ask because I because I could see for some the the idea of a subsystem solely around solely around conflict is one of those habits that they that they that they kind of stick with. Um, right. And given given that you mentioned hero points, um, I hear that and I immediately think of the extra effort system that's in a lot that's in a lot of games is it a is it a case where you can you you can use a hero point to do a do over at the very least and what else could someone do with hero points well they're called drama points drama um, points sorry and you don't get do overs with them you just take over the the narration or you break the rules in some way that's what they're designed for mm -hmm. so there's no hard and fast rules there's suggestions in the book throughout of how you might use a drama point in an interrogation. I might spend one to ask you another question um, in a vignette. I might throw a, a, a drama point into your vignette to add a detail that I think you overlooked, or I want this NP NPC in that situation and you weren't adding it. So it's giving me narrative control that I shouldn't have beyond the scope of the rules. That's what drama points are mostly used for. So and then they're also used to give you some power over the finale. So it's an edit. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. It's an edit. Yeah, which is cer is certainly something I've seen I've seen done with sit with similar resources, although not although not as frequent as the extra effort thing I mentioned before. Um, when Spe it comes speaking to the uh, do over thing, mm -hmm. what you could use it for is let's say you're writing a vignette and you want my character to get his hand broken. I could spend the drama point to say, no, that doesn't happen. Um, and mm -hmm. once that point is spent, you can't undo that unless you spend a drama point. Yeah. Right. So you can't say, okay, fine. It's not your hand. It's your, it's your foot. No, that, you know, that's, I've already spent the point. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, when it comes to drama points, is it a case where at the start of the session, people are granted a set number and that, and that's it. Or are there ways to gain drama points through play? Everybody starts with one. Um, if you if you like having more power, the rules tell you give everybody an additional or two additional points. Mm -hmm. um, you also get them interrogations by stealing them from people. And you also get them in interludes by not being in the scene. All right. So it's, de so it's definitely not one of those cases where hoarding, where hoarding them is, get, is going to be advisable. Uh, there's two different ways to play that, right? I, I've seen people hoard them, and then they have a bunch at the end of the game, and then they don't, don't even spend them all. Um, and then the way I like to play is I just spend them like mad because I want to mix up the story and I want to add details. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I generally don't. I generally am sitting on zero or one drama point when I'm playing. Yeah, it's the reason I say that is um, there's a bit of a habit among pl among players of all stripes that when you have some sort of powerful limited resource the tendency is to hold it for a rainy day even if that rainy right. day never comes right 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 um yeah i call that the the reptile philosophy right it's a <laughs> crocodile clutching her eggs and making sure nobody gets to them there mm -hmm. we do that a lot in any game that we're playing because we don't know when that power is going to go away and we don't want to give it up it's holding on to every wand charge right uh, you don't know what the last one's going to be so you don't use your wand yep and when it now, when it com when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, setup that you have for um ho for home, you um like like we said we stated before, this is a bit more of an expand expanded version of its of its original um document. Yeah. Even with even with that, um, what would you say the um total page count is going to be for the thing? 
Well, this one is totally done already, and mm-hmm. I'm sitting at, I think, 94 pages? 94. Mm-hmm. Um, and everything's done. All the art's in place. All the graphics are done. Um, yeah, it's all been edited and everything. I can print it today. Mm-hmm. Now, you you also mentioned about um, about GM tools. If you want, if somebody wanted to integrate this into um, into traditional fantasy RPGs, yes. Um, now, when it com- when it comes to that, when it comes to that sort of integration, I'm cur- I'm curious what some of the um, do's and do- do's and don'ts on on that are. Uh, well, one of the things is you don't want to rush through. You're still going to do card draws as the game master to see where the story is going, mm-hmm. but you're going to frame those scenes. You're going to determine what they do next. And depending on whether or not you're doing this, let's say you're doing this with your D&D campaign, right? Mm -hmm. If it's already been going on, you don't need to do character creation. You don't need to do world building. You have that done. But you're going to have the the adventure start for them. Okay, you guys are going off to war, and then you play through that a little bit, and now they've surrendered, and now they're on their way home, Mm -hmm. right? And now you as a game master can play through the deck, and let's say you want to play 16 or 20 scenes, you're going to use the deck and the charts to help inform how you run that those sessions. And that can go as long or as short as you want to. But the advice is, is not to burn through the deck too fast. Let things simmer. Let the players, let some of the scenes breathe. Um, and let the players see where things go. And, and don't be afraid to let it go off the rails a little bit. You don't need a card draw for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're starting a new D&D campaign with this, for instance, uh, you can go through the whole process of making characters. Go through it. They're still going to have to make D&D characters because they're still playing D&D. You're just using the deck as a tool. Yeah. Do you suppose that this would be easier to do you suppose that this would be more difficult or just, or about the same level of difficulty to adapt to fantasy settings that aren't using some aren't using some version of the d20 system i think any system would be fine honestly rune quest uh fantasy hero gurps fantasy shadow not shadow run what's the fantasy version earth dawn mm-hmm. honestly i don't see why you couldn't do with any of those you just have to, it has to be things have to be a little grounded if your 15th level characters in D this is a dumb adventure yeah. Right, that who would want to play this at fifteenth level? Mm-hmm. And with a lot of the draws, I've noticed that the emphasis is on um, is on car- is on card value and suit, like I mentioned before. But yeah, I'm curious if face cards play any um, play any special factor beyond 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 value, or is it ju- or is it just written as eleven, twelve, thirteen when it comes to face cards? No, the face cards are on there, and I generally make them more interesting on the charts than numbered values. But everything, I mean, everything plays the same. There's no special rules for them. Mm-hmm. They just, they have a little more cachet. Oh. And what now, when it comes to, when it comes to the role, I know, I, I know it's mentioned that they're essentially a, a character class without rules slash powers. Right. Um. Would would roles would roles kind of imply what that particular role is good at and what they might struggle with? Yes, absolutely. That is written into the description, and you as an adult are expected to just bring that to the table in your role play, mm-hmm. right? If you're a longbowman, then you should be having scenes where you're hunting game to feed everybody on the way home. Versus if you are the the chaplain or the commander, you have a totally different kind of responsibility in the story yeah and would it would it be fair of me to say that none of the rules outright explicitly state this is a, this is a role that is tied to magic use because i could see that being an issue if somebody's doing a lo- a um, very low magic or even um historical fantasy approach well there is the war mage but it, it explicitly says don't use this your first time playing and don't use this if you're playing. You don't want magic in your game. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- I think that's the only one that has magic. The rest are all just soldiers. Yeah. And 
Now, I, now I know in the premise it ta it talks about um about the sol soldiers com soldiers coming home after a after lo after losing a significant battle, um, but some something that I had I had considered when I was reading through the material available is would would it still be viable if it was a case of not a uh, not a loss but a mutual ceasefire because both sides ended up having way too many casualties absolutely whatever you want to set up as mm -hmm. the 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 contrition between the two sides is fine so long as these soldiers are making the way home right they're they're marching through a long distance to get back to their families mm -hmm. and it's not easy right they're, they may even encounter people that don't like them and when it com when it com when it comes to when it comes to that particular journey um in the span in the span of a in the span of a round is is it go it, are you pl are you planning on putting in rules for to simulate a kind of day night cycle as they travel no i leave that up to the the players to decide when time has passed the, the location cards give you a sense of how much time has passed mm -hmm. between scenes, so you could use that as a gauge. Um, I've built that into other protocols. I have a wrestling one where you know the fan reaction based on the card draw. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you wanted to write a scene where you did a real, had a really good night of wrestling, the fans are not reacting to it, so it doesn't matter. Um, and there's other ones that tell you how much time has passed. Uh, but with this one, you know, you might draw, let's say, the the five of uh, diamonds, and that's going to give you a farm, a, an, an ignored or plague-born farm. Mm -hmm. So you have the option there is to say, okay, well, the previous scene was at a tavern, and now we're in a farm. We've only probably gone a couple of miles. Um, it Time really hasn't passed very much here. That might be your decision as the director. And when it comes to, lo when it comes to location, um, do you have... Do you have some material in mind when it comes to weather or do you leave that up to the to the table there is a card draw for a drastic change in weather that is one of them but otherwise the players can absolutely add whatever they want mm -hmm. and in this edition i've created uh an additional scene chart an additional location chart if you've been playing enough and you're bored with the original charts so e the the queen on both charts is a change in weather it's just, it's just one that I'd uh, I'd pro I'd probably advi I'd probably advise others to make to make the change in weather at least sensible like don't ha don't have yeah. a, don't have a monsoon in the in the middle of a temperate area <laughs> right right well it's generic so that's really up to the players it just says a drastic change in weather mm -hmm. so but really uh, you know it's a fantasy world do whatever you want oh uh, I've Obviously, but um, I could see I could see some people deciding to do that just <coughs> just for the lulls of it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Well, I'm in I'm in a state where the where the saying is the if you don't like the weather, wait ten minutes. So <laughs> right, right. Now you've now you've um you've had this you've had this quick starter up for a, for a few days. It yeah. ends in eight. It ends in eight days. Yeah. Um, I know I know it's more or less a quick starter but um how but um how what were you seeing as far as a release window for the uh, P, for the PDF launch immediately it'll be out immediately it it's done so as soon as I have everybody's money in my pocket because mm -hmm. it takes uh it takes a few days for for Kickstarter to transfer the funds to me but as soon as I have them everybody's going to get their PDFs mm -hmm. and then the books will go out as soon as they approve them Right, because it takes uh, drive-through a couple of couple of days as well to approve the files and then send me a proof. Mm -hmm. So I can't see why people wouldn't have the book in their hands within a month of the end date. Yeah. Now, in one of the stretch goals, you had mentioned creating a home-specific um, poker deck for purchase later. Is that something that you that you would that you would set up on? Um, on your on your on your site and w and would that be one of those things where you just put up an update when it's ready? Yeah, it would be on drive through, so it would mm -hmm. be a POD poker deck, and I've built those before. I've got about ten different poker decks on there, mm -hmm. 
Um, I really like making them. So it would just be a matter of, yeah, everybody, here's where the link is. Go help yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you've backed at the $100 level, you get one for free. So I would just ship it to you. Yeah. Yeah, you in some of the stretch goals you had mentioned, shipping is paid now, so there's none of that backer kit nonsense. Have you? Yeah, um, I hate backer kit so much. What? I've heard I've heard people have their fair share of stories with with backer kit, or in, in some cases, game found. Um, but what what's your what's your reason for having having some animosity towards backer kit? My my reason is quite long and complicated. I don't know how long you we have here. You've but, got it um, as as long as you want. In general, I don't like any of these third party products that that do your pledge manager for you. The one built into Kickstarter isn't perfect, but it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why people can't use it. But my biggest problem is you're handing over my data to another company, and I didn't ask you to do that, right? So and the few times that it's been done to me, because I won't back anybody that uses a backer kit now, but the few times that it was done to me, it was a surprise that they were using a third-party product because they didn't tell me that they were. Um, and then you also run into the problem with if they're asking for shipping after the fact, you're now holding my 30 or 40 or $50 hostage unless I cough up another 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. And so you, I got to get my credit card off to somebody else. I got to hope that that doesn't get hacked and backer kit has been hacked. So that's, that's just more work for me as a consumer with me changing my credit card number and everything else. Um, I just, I just find it, I just find it, it's just too much work and stress on me. I'm a very private person. Mm -hmm. I don't want my data out there where it doesn't need to be. And I know it's the internet and they got my data everywhere, but why one more site? And uh, the, the last thing really is that it's, it's what I call scavenger economics, right? Mm -hmm. You've run your Kickstarter. You've done all the work of putting the game together. You've done all the work of marketing it and everything else. And now you're handing over, two or three percent or whatever it is their fee charge is right to this other company that had nothing to do with your success who just made a good program and that's i don't like that i don't like that at all um, i don't like those people that come to me and say for five hundred dollars i'll help you market your kickstarter no you won't you just want five hundred dollars and maybe you'll publish an article mm -hmm. it's all that same scavenger economics and i don't i don't like it no. And I think anybody that's artistic should be against that kind of economics, right? Because we're mm -hmm. all making something from nothing. And oh, yeah. here these people are coming in, and because they made an app, they think they deserve a thousand dollars. Yeah. And I've seen I've I've seen my I've seen my fair share of interesting things re regarding the whole shipping thing, whether it's, and ult ultimately uh, ultimately I all I can say on the matter is it's a um mess <laughs> yeah. i think that's the most charitable way way i can put it now i this is now this is one of those this is one of those questions that i find myself having to ask simply because appar apparently i'm petty enough to point this out in every one of my reviews <laughs> all right i look forward to this but with but even though it, even though it's only 90 pages will there be an index yeah, it's already made. Yeah. yeah, it's two pages long. Yeah, I, I realize that sounds incredibly ridiculous to to ask for a ninety page book, but it's it's one of those it's been one of those sticking points with me for years with um RPG books. Yeah, if a book is long enough, I put in an index. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I wouldn't bother with a thirty page book. I don't see how that would be useful. But there's enough stuff here. I filled two pages. Um in the book with with information that I know you're going to have to index you're going to have to look up later yeah i've i've seen i've seen some people put out some put out like 200 page books that don't have an index or don't or don't have bookmarks and <laughs> i yeah. that's what that's one of my red that's one of my big red flags no i hear you i totally understand where you're coming from oh i mean some some people will go out of their way and put and put bookmarks and hyperlinks, but don't put an index. Um, that's not ideal for me, but I'm at least I'm at least willing to tolerate that as long as it's digital. Um, right. And some some people um they're they're only doing like a 15 page thing, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, get on their case for just that. 
but I um I'm very big on navigation. Yeah. You should you sh- much in the same way that when you're on a site, you should know exactly where you are, where you need to go, where you need to go to get what you want, and how to get there. I think the same thing applies with an RPG book, doubly so because you're going to be looking at that book a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I I am not somebody that personally needs an index with everything, but I understand other people's needs for it, mm-hmm. so I just do it. Um, and I think that's the difference between working in publishing and working as a as a boutique, right? Is is you do work on a book you wouldn't necessarily think you need to do. Uh, the amount of time I spend writing examples of play is exhausting to me. It's my least favorite part of writing a book. But I do it. I spend a lot of time doing it because somebody's reading this book for the first time. And they're reading this game line for the first time. Mm-hmm. And they they have questions. And examples yeah. of play are going to help those people. Yep. Now... You've been doing the, you've been doing the protocol system for for about six for about six years now. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Have, what would you say have been some of the big learning experiences you've gotten from feedback on the system? Uh, well, I think early on I was making games that were extremely generic. Um. And as I got better at it, I started making more specific stories. And those more specific stories that came out later are much more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it sounds unfun that you, the game becomes that narrow, but uh, and, and it would seem like it doesn't have as much replay value. But you actually end up generating a better story with something akin to my game called uh, Dead Things in the Walls, mm-hmm. which is a very specific kind of horror um, but that plays much better than Eons, which was the 10th game I made, uh, which is just generic horror. Do what you want with it. I, I can certainly see how that how that would work, because when you have when you have that wide of a uh, sandbox, you can run the risk of cho- of choice paralysis. I see the same thing when it comes to universal games where, yes, you can use this. Un- you can use a universal game like Hero or G- or GURPS to make just about any sort of ca- any sort of character or characters you want but the downside is you can literally make any kind of character you want <laughs> right right it's not that's not a knock on those on those kind of games it's just it's just that sort of freedom is a double edged sword and for for some um having that having that much choice they're they're going they're not going to be able to figure out which direction to actually start in and stick with right Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, If you're the artist, if you're creating the product, Mm -hmm. you want a lot of choice initially in your design, but eventually you have to start narrowing things down. That's what design is. It's choices. But you want to give people a specific... I get into this argument with Owen Stevens all the time because Owen thinks that fantasy can be anything. And he thinks that a space marine can be right there alongside... uh, Conan the Barbarian in module B2. And I don't agree. I don't think those two things belong in the same kind of environment. And I think if you made a game where there are just five character classes and this is it, these are the five tightly defined themes that I think belong in this game world, you're going to get a much more concise game experience out of it Mm -hmm. than you would if you gave people the option of 300 books and say, go wild, do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, as far as as far as the whole as far as the whole fan, fantasy can, fantasy can be anything thing, um, I rem- I've heard I've heard my own versions of versions of that over the years, and I've never really I've never really agreed with that because I end up I end up thinking, okay, if we're gonna take that route, then you'd have then you'd have to ju- you'd have to justify how you're gonna have high and low magic characters within within the same room, and sometimes. A good. It's true that a good enough GM can make can make that work, but that's a bandage, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I know how I would solve it off the top of my head, but you know, you're absolutely right. When you when the players have that much control over what they can play, it's just more work on the game master to make it make sense. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that it, I'm not saying that a GM can't do it, but you're but um. 
it is a massive gamble to yeah. put to um, put that responsibility on the GM because you don't know you don't know whether the GM is going to be able to do that. Right. Right. And I've often found that um, peop that the most reliable thing to foster creativity is limitation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can you if you need if you need a um, non-gaming example of that just look at the work just look at the workarounds when it came to the um, younger days of film. Right. I was going to use that example, the Hayes code. Once the Hayes code comes out. Mhm. Mm um it's the Hayes code, right? Or is that comic books? Um, yeah, it, w it was the Hayes Code for film. It was the it was the um, Comics Code Authority for comic books. Right. So when the Hayes Code comes around, you actually get better movies mm -hmm. because now if you want sex or you want violence, you have to find a creative way to do it mm -hmm. to get it to the audience. Now I'm not going to say that I'm pro censorship, right? I don't think mm -hmm. that that's always the right way to go. But when you give yourself limitations as a creator and you say, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it that way. I think uh, you can see that example in uh, Kevin Smith's work, right? When he doesn't have a budget, he's a much better director. Mm -hmm. When he has too much money at his disposal, he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Um. And of course, of course, when you mentioned Ke when you mentioned Kevin Smith, the I I ended up immediately thinking of Super of Superman Lives, and that that was <laughs> that was completely out of his control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. But but another ex another example of that whole idea of of limitations that when it comes to that is Jaws. They did not have the budget to show all of the shark like they initially wanted to. Right. So they they enacted changes so you so they were only able to show the part that they had actually made because making the, making a um, making even a partial animatronic of that of that shark wasn't going to come cheap even in the seventies. Right. And it's yeah, no doubt. I think uh, the um, Spielberg's another mm -hmm. example of somebody that works better with a budget and, and restraints. That was only a second film. Yeah, is for if you want to count if you want to count Duel as a film. Some people don't it's, because it was a yeah. because it was a glorified made for TV thing. Uh, it was. It's my favorite movie that he made, so I will count it. <laughs> I think it's. Uh, yeah. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how. Um, how the how protocol squared home um, develops, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the yeah. insanity at play here. Yes, absolutely. And, Thanks for having me. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>